I remember growing up and uh, feeling the pressure that if you didn't hold on to what you were taught, then somehow that was lacking faith. And, uh, or if you questioned things, if you doubted um, and you asked God about those doubts or you brought those doubts before God, that somehow that was wrong. And I struggled with that for many years. I grew up in a very uh, abusive household. Uh, my father and I did not have a good relationship. Um, he was actually my adopted father, so I was adopted out at age uh, 18 months old. Basically, the first memory I have of my life was at age three, and it was of a car accident. And I, I like to think that God had always been with me because at that moment, moments before the car accident, God had uh, touched my spirit and I felt it. He had touched my spirit and I became self-aware of myself. And I had all these questions right before the accident, like, who am I? And then who are these people in the front seat? And then I look to my side and I see my sister and just, there was something in my soul that just lit up and I said, I know who you are, you're my sister. I like to think that that was kind of the beginning of my story where God was always with me and was helping me through all the dark years. I like to think that my life was basically that of Job's um, in my own right, where I struggled for 24 years with suicide, with you know depression, um, with just self-punishment because of everything I went through with my dad. Uh, the, th the things I got from my dad were that I was a liar, manipulative, and rebellious, all because he wasn't willing to accept fault or to see anything other than uh, how he had seen it. So that was kind of how I came into this story, which I'm going to tell you, um, where my faith became my faith instead of just what I was taught in the Pentecostal church. So I started at the age of 19. I was, uh, I had graduated high school and I had uh, gotten free of my dad. I'd stolen a letter that was written to me um, from my biological mom. She had just gotten a hold of us. And my father had told me that he would decide when I was ready. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, like, that's outrageous. Like, you're 19 years old. You have a right to know who you, you know, who you are and who you belong to and what your history is. And that's the thing that I've felt from God is every one of us has a right to know our history. You know, it doesn't matter what culture you're from, what background you're from, everyone has a right to know where you come from and what that means for what God has made you for. And I had a lot of those struggles. So at age 19, when I finally got in contact with her, uh, I found out that she was in Oregon. I grew up in Oklahoma, so I naturally had uh, taken a bus to Oregon. And somewhere within the first year, I had this question, what if the Christian faith is wrong? What, there's all these different people in the world that have uh, this faith and they're holding on to it all the way to the end. And I just thought, well, you know, all the stuff that's happened in the world, the, the fact the world exists, the fact that we think the way we do and the, the things that we're faced with, there must be a God. With that thought, I thought, how sad would it be you know, there's all these people, if I'm serving the right God and all of them, I like a lot of people. And I think it's sad that they should end up in hell and me not, or me end up in hell and they don't. And so I wanted to know like, who's the real God? Because I think it's just completely idiotic and just nonsensical, just unthinking to just hold on to something all the way to the end because you know, a fear that you'll be judged by people. I was more concerned with, well, I want to make sure that I'm being judged by God and know which one he is. And so I remember leaving the house and I went out about my day. I had to go uh, get a food handler's card, do basic stuff, start my life off. I had enough money for a food handler's card and a little extra. So I went out and the first thought that crossed my mind with all that going on, I then thought, God, I want to know who you are. And I called out to him, I said, I want to know who you are, so whoever you are, you know, like I've heard about the Buddha God, the, uh, about Allah, about like the Viking gods, and a part of me was like, yes, I hope it's the Viking gods, maybe I'll be like the guy that brings it back, maybe they've been forgotten. It was kind of a hope, but I started with what I knew because it was the strongest for me, and I said, I'm going to start with that, and if you don't answer me, I promise you I'll go off to someone else, but if you don't answer me, don't you dare send me to hell. 
And I spoke to him candidly like that. I, I had, I probably used some choice words in there. And I was very direct with him. I want to know. And I will know. And if don't you dare judge me otherwise. Near the end of the day, I was coming home. I got everything done that I needed to get done. I bought a pack of cigarettes. I had started uh, smoking addiction in that year. And I had actually spent into the money I needed for my food handler's card. And I just, for a second, had this grace place upon me. When I had left the store and I started walking home, normally I would be very self-punishment, hit myself in the head, hurt myself, just run myself down until I'm just in such a suicidal, depressive mood that, you know, there's something wrong with me. But none of that happened. Instead, I had this grace placed upon me as I started walking home and I said, God, I messed up. I need your help. You know, please provide me with the money. Um, and this was not how I talked to God before. Uh, it was like a total drastic change. And I just had this thought drop in my head. Be thankful for the little things and I'll multiply it. So I was like, that's an interesting idea. And I saw a penny in front of me and I picked it up. And I was like, okay, well, I give it a shot. I was like, thank you God for this penny. I, I'm, I'm gonna believe that you'll multiply it. I took seven more steps. Two more pennies, literally side by side. And I thought, wow, you know, like maybe this is actually happening. So I picked those two pennies up and I said, I thank you for multiplying the, that penny. I believe that you're going to multiply more. And so kind of like a person goes around looking, you know, for like homeless people looking for change on the ground. I kept walking and walking and walking. I'd probably walked a quarter of a mile. And I just got to this point where all of a sudden that grace was lifted off of me. I was like, Everything that is my normal go-to under pressure, the self-punishment, the self-hate, uh, all the negative words towards myself and what I thought other people thought about me uh, just just crushed me. And I just felt, you know, like all that came crashing in and out of me came this anger and the sadness that showed itself through anger. I just pulled my pack of cigarettes down, threw it down in the grass and started walking away. As I started walking, I heard this still quiet voice that said, son, you've got a cigarette, you know, addiction, and you're gonna smoke cigarettes either way. Do you wanna go snipe some nasty cigarettes out of the ashtray, or do you wanna smoke a fresh pack of cigarettes? It's not wise to have spent the money and then just throw it away and then ask me for more money. Go get the cigarettes, we'll deal with the cigarette addiction later. I had gone back and I went to go pick up the cigarettes and literally because I had to lean down to pick the cigarettes up, right next to the pack of cigarettes was frozen a $20 bill, which was a thousand fold increase from the two pennies. It was twice as much money as I needed for the food handler's card. It was this first answer that I got. If you really want to know God wholeheartedly and there's no reservation in your heart that says, well, I don't know if I really want to believe, you know, maybe, you know, like maybe you're hoping that he doesn't answer you so you can continue in the sin that you're doing because maybe you like the sin. You got to seek wholeheartedly God. You got to want to know because you've got one life to live. And if you mess it up, if you end up going all the way to the end and you don't find out what's true and false before the end, like I did, where I found out that God exists and therefore his word stands true, what's the point in losing your life? This wasn't a one time and done kind of circumstance and my life wasn't amazing afterwards. Like it wasn't an instant fix. You know, I went on for the next five years going through uh, doing things the same way I did them, but now with the added card of having to learn reliance on God and trying to learn what that means and how that looks like. There were so many times that God provided just little things. Uh, you know, I'd be homeless and traveling, you know, just like hitchhiking. And I was just like, God, I need money for food. And things like walking down the road after I say amen, you know, literally a few steps, find a $5 bill on the side of the highway, you know, the, the, the windiest place because all these cars are going, it's just stuck on the highway. And then I go a little bit further down the highway and there's a Wendy's and you can get four chicken sandwiches for five bucks, you know, exactly. And it's like, you know, I didn't continue those things 
You know, it wasn't like call on God and he'll bail you out. It's more so, you know, I was, in, I was very intent. My life was messed up. I needed help and choices I was making was destroying me. I would just say, be real with God. You know, don't try to fake it. Don't take the religious route. If you want to live a real life, you want to go far, be real, be vulnerable because no one likes a fake. And you ain't gonna like yourself if you're being fake. The thing that you'll see is God is a loving God. And it's a journey. It's not just a, oh, I read it in the Bible. It's a, you know, test him and see. But, you know, the religious route will always hide, will always try to take those fig leaves and, you know, hide the shame rather than being vulnerable. And the thing that Jesus uh, the reason why Jesus died on the cross wasn't just for our sin, but that we could have that relationship again so we could take the fig leaves off and let him clothe us with the lamb. And that way we would no longer walk in shame and guilt because that's such a huge thing in our culture is shame and guilt. The thing is, God loves you. God does not walk, want you walking in shame and guilt. You may be doing things that uh, are shameful and bear guilt, but he wants you to come to the cross trust in the cross and let him do and do the change in you because the more you try to change you you're just going to find you don't have the power outside of him you have no power to change yourself and you're going to find yourself speaking uh, things of your life that you think are true because you see evidence but it's not true and if you listen to the father's heart if you take some time to be silent you might actually find that he says this over and over again, I just want you to know I love you. I'm Eric Brendelin, and this is my story.